What would you say to someone then who says that Calvinism, as it's classically known, or Reformed theology, hinders evangelism? Well, let's just ask an honest question. Um, first of all, we, if we're going to talk about Calvinism, this is what I tell people. We need to make sure that we're using the right or the same dictionary. Okay, so if someone comes to me and they're an anti-Calvinist and they say, your Calvinism offends me, I don't think that, um, that, that Calvinism is good for the sake of the gospel and it, it hinders evangelism, then I want to first and foremost ask this question, what's your definition of Calvinism? Because they may be operating from a, a certain definition of Calvinism that I might not agree with. And so we might have an entire debate on these issues using two different definitions. So let's define the terms. And then let's talk honestly, okay? What does the Bible say? What does Ephesians 1 say? When, when the Bible clearly uses the word predestination, and when God says that he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, you can try to dance around that. You can try to do you know, hermeneutical gymnastics and get around that if you want. But if you're going to be honest with the scriptures... God was at work in the plan of salvation of unbelievers long before he created the world, long before he said, let there be light, and there was light, long before he created the first two human beings. So we have to be honest with the biblical language. You might not like the, the term Calvinism. Fine, that's fine. But let's talk biblical terminology. Let's talk theology from the pages of Scripture. So what does predestination mean? When it says in John 1, 12 and 13, that we were born, born again, not because of blood, not because of the will of the flesh, not because of the will of man, but we were born of God. And when we see that we are born because of God's will, born again because of God's will, when we see language in the Bible, so in the early pages of Ephesians, where it says that, that we were once, you know, dead in our trespasses and sins, chapter 2, but that God made us alive, that he made us alive. What does that mean? So how do we do this? How do we cause ourselves to be born again? Well, we can't. And so we just have to be honest with the language of Scripture. But furthermore, I would say this. The most, um, the most passionate, zealous missionaries of church history were Calvinists. Let's talk about Adoniram Judson. Let's talk about William Carey. Let's talk about Charles Spurgeon, this pastor theologian in England who was a five-point Calvinist who was unashamedly standing upon uh, Calvinistic soteriology. Uh, but he was one of the most passionate, zealous-hearted, uh, missionary-minded pastors that the church in recent years has seen. And so when we start looking at that, John Calvin himself gets a, 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 terrible, a terrible handling as far as history is concerned. Many of the people, so let's just talk about Calvin's church in Geneva. You have people that were fleeing persecution coming to Geneva so that they could escape persecution. They're being trained in Calvin's church, sent out to plant churches all around uh, all around the, 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 the landscape, if you will, in Europe. And many of those people, you can read different, um, different accounts in history, you will find that they paid in their blood. They never made it back home. They never went back to their home church to show their PowerPoint mm -hmm. slides <laughs> about you know, how God was growing their work and their church planting movement because they were killed. And so Calvin was seeing this. You talk about someone who's planting churches, a church planting ministry, that was John Calvin. And he was extremely missions-minded. And so he literally shook the world with the gospel. And so to call him a hyper-Calvinist is just not to treat him in the right vein of church history. Furthermore, um, Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism are two totally different terms. So when we hear people that are anti-Calvinist, they're using the, the language of hyper-Calvinism, we need to be very careful when we paste that or when we attach that term to someone.
That's a technical term that has a very specific meaning that talks about a heresy where someone was unbalanced in their theology to the point that they said, God is so sovereign that he will save the heathen without your aid or mine. Just like the older gentleman who stood, well, when William Carey stood up and was talking about going to India and asked the question among his, his uh, group of pastors there. And he said, should we go out and use means to reach the heathen with the gospel? And the man scolded young William Carey and told him to sit down that if God was pleased to save the heathen, that he would do so without your aid or mine. And so that's classic hyper-Calvinism. Now, be grateful that William Carey did not just sit down, that he did not just shut up, but he actually went with a passionate heart to reach the heathen with the gospel. And what did he do? He did just that. But when we see the, the great success of William Carey, and we think about how God used that man, then we think about the fact that he was operating uh, from a foundation of a robust view of God's sovereignty and salvation. William Carey, in short, was a Calvinist. And so all of these people that we see in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, oftentimes you'll hear people chattering about and debating about the sovereignty of God and Calvinism. Is Calvinism good for the convention or it's not? And then you have good people that want to talk about the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. It was built by Calvinists. And then they want to use Lottie Moon at Christmas time to talk about this Christmas offering. Well, Lottie Moon was a Calvinist. So when you hear people say things like, you know, those Calvinists, you know, or that they call people hyper Calvinists, they'll call Spurgeon a hyper Calvinist or whatever else. Do you really want to say that Spurgeon's in hell? Do you really want, are you willing to say that William Carey's in hell? Are you willing to say that, you know, someone like, like Adoniram Judson is in hell? You know, I don't think so. And so let's be very careful in how we use the language of hyper-Calvinism.